हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाईजूज आई एस बाईजूज आई एस में आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत है सो गाइज टुडे द सेवेंथ ऑफ अप्रैल इट्स अ संडे इट्स अ ब्राइट सनी डे आउटसाइड एंड वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस टुडेज टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम द हिंदू न्यूज पेपर द टॉपिक्स आर एक्सट्रीमली इंटरेस्टिंग ऑब्वियसली मोस्ट ऑफ द टॉपिक्स आर इंटरेस्टिंग और एंड इम्पॉर्टेंट विच इज वाई वी आर हेयर टू स्टडी बट मोर देन इम्पोर्टेंस the thing that should catch our attention is that it should be interesting so once we find things interesting automatically we would be able to study without having any stress without having any mental pressure and we would also be able to gain results so we hope that we are able to study in an interesting fashion where things catch our attention and we also find it motivating as well as interesting it should make us happy it should make us inquisitive so let's start with today's class in with this thought so the topics that are supposed to be covered today the topics are in today's newspaper as you can see the topics are focusing on varied subjects on varied things like the citizenship amendment act the discussion on which doesn't seem to end the rules allow dual citizenship how does it allow dual citizenship an interesting take something that is absolutely different has not been talked about before we'll talk about it today states offer thousands of hectares of degraded forest land again a very very interesting topic how do we look at uh, allocating this kind of forest land for this purpose influenza h5n1 another flu so these flus these viruses don't seem to end Kachatibu Islands an interesting topic a different take and why are we talking about it today i mean all of a sudden something that happened way back almost 5 decades back 1974 why are we talking about kachatibu today will the new solar power rules boost production this is about the kusum scheme that the government of india came with and the outlook on women's employment also a part of social issues so these are the important topics that we'll be covering in today's class and from today's newspaper students ask a specific set in order to understand that what are we studying how are we studying etc etc hence i give the topics first then we do a couple of main questions and thereafter what we do is we ascribe certain facts which can be called as prelims bites all right so let's start with the first article we are talking about the citizenship amendment act caa what have the rules allowed and what are we talking about this is a very interesting article why i'll tell you so you and i we are natural citizens of india or let's say we are citizens of india by birth so citizenship is something which all of us are extremely proud of and you should be proud of indian citizenship it is not something which we have just gotten on a platter so our ancestors our forefathers the freedom fighters have fought for it and only then we have been given independence due to which we have been granted indian citizenship so the citizenship provisions were included in the constitution via article 5 to article 12 these were the articles that were focusing on granting citizenship to varied types of people citizenship by birth citizenship by inclusion of territory citizenship by shifting or migrating from foreign countries back to india post independence shifting on the basis of division or on the basis of partition the people who belong to uh, the erstwhile west pakistan and east pakistan who wanted to come back to india so citizenship was provided via these articles to all of these people all of these people but one rule was common and standard and that rule was that india allows for india allows for single citizenship i repeat india allows for single citizenship rather i should say that india does not allow dual citizenship what does dual citizenship mean dual citizenship refers to a person becoming a citizen of two countries in the same two countries at the same time so you are a dual citizen you are a citizen of us as well as canada you are a citizen of country a as well as country b 
So you are the citizen of both countries at the same time. There are certain countries in the world that actually allow this, that you are a dual citizen. So you might just want to comment, search and comment and tell me which are those countries that allow dual citizenship in the world. But the question is, if you are or if we are, all of us are Indian citizens, is dual citizenship allowed for us people like you and me? The answer to that is no, dual citizenship is not allowed. Which is why a very prominent example, something that all of you would resonate with and know about is the example of the actor Akshay Kumar. Akshay Kumar took up Canadian citizenship long back and this is not something which is hidden, this is public knowledge. When he opted for Canadian citizenship, he was given the option in India, he was told that because India doesn't allow for dual citizenship, either you renounce Canadian citizenship, renunciation or renouncement, it's an English term, the dictionary meaning of renunciation is to give up, to give up to leave something. So renounce Canadian citizenship, your Indian citizenship will be intact. If you continue to hold Canadian passport and Canadian citizenship, your Indian citizenship will automatically revoke without any notice, without any warning, without anything. That is how single citizenship works in India because India allows only for this. It does not allow for this. Now, what is the bone of contention? So when we talk about dual citizenship and single citizenship, it's by law. It's not something that you and I are saying. It's not something that the prime minister or any of the erstwhile uh, minister or cabinet minister or any person has said. This is something that the law says. The law is by the name of, all of you know it, it is by the name of Citizenship Act, which was enacted in the year 1955. According to Citizenship Act, the provision of single citizenship is sacrosanct. It is not something that can be, that will wave or that will go to any other place. When we talk about the Citizenship Act, you can simply know it does not allow dual citizenship and the amendments which are done are done in the same law, which is why we call it CAA, Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA. Now, the Citizenship Act allows single citizenship and this is something which is explicitly stated until the amendment of CAA that was announced in 2019. So the CAA amendment that was announced in 2019 actually has a very interesting take. I would say it has a very confusing take, uh, take about the citizenship which is being granted to illegal immigrants from other countries, which means that those people the people who are being granted citizenship in India, they cross the border illegally, which means they are staying in India illegally, but they would have been citizens in their own countries. Example, if we take the example of Mr. X, Mr. X was a citizen of either of these three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, because CAA applies on people from three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. They entered into India, they entered into India before 31st December 2014 and this entry was illegal. It wasn't legal, it wasn't with papers because had it been with papers, with papers, what I mean with papers is with visa, if the, uh, uh, if the entry would have been by visa then automatically they would have been allowed to stay legally. There was no problem but they entered without a visa. Because they entered without a visa, they are called as illegal immigrants. These people have the proof of discovery, proof of ownership or proof to prove that they had entered illegally. They have to show a proof since when have they been living in India, first, second. They also have to show a proof which country they have migrated from. Only then they can apply for citizenship via CAA 2019. Now the point in this is, catch in this is, that CAA 2019 does not ask them, I repeat, it does not ask them to renounce their, renounce their earlier citizenship. 
CAA 2019 is granting citizenship to illegal immigrants from these three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. When I say that they have been granting or the citizenship to them is being granted, the citizenship to them is being granted by India via this law and at the same time India is not, India is not mandating them or it is not the obligation of those people who are being granted citizenship to give up the citizenship of the country that they have come from. So let's say a Pakistani citizen who crossed the border illegally and who has been staying in India for many years, who was in India before this cutoff date, has applied for Indian citizenship with the Indian government, will be granted Indian citizenship and he also holds Pakistani citizenship because he was a Pakistani citizen earlier. This is in contradiction to the law that was enacted and the name of the law is Citizenship Act because India does not allow dual citizenship. Now think, think law is a very very interesting subject. It's a different thing which basically says that it is contradictory and hence there, has, there have been PILs, there have been petitions by the, uh, uh, by the Muslim Union who are represented by some noted lawyers, the names of whom I would just disclose to you. And now the government has to think on this because the case is in front of the Supreme Court. So let's have a look what is being said. The petitioners represented by the Indian Union Muslim League and lawyers Kapil Sibyl and Harris Piran criticized the 2024 CAA rules for overlooking the necessity of renouncing citizenship. You are not supposed like this is not a mandate. If you are coming from some other country, you have the citizenship of that country, you are applying for Indian citizenship, you are getting Indian citizenship without having to renounce the earlier citizenship. So this is in contradiction to what? It is in contradiction to the Citizenship Act of 1955. It's a problem. And the constitution explicitly prohibits dual citizenship. So how can we go against the own law that was enacted way back? Probably the government did not think about this. It did not think it through. But right now it has to think because yes, two laws cannot be contradictory, which is typically required for citizenship acquisition when another nationality is held. Allowing dual citizenship, especially with one being Indian, is deemed ultra-virus. Basically it is void. If you are being granted Indian citizenship, it is on the condition that you are not a citizen of any other country. If you become the citizen of any other country, then your Indian citizenship automatically, without a discussion, stands revoked. It is not something which is valid. It stands revoked and arbitrary by the petitioners who argue that it violates the principle of citizenship as have been outlined in the law. This is what has happened. So this is an interesting take that we have discussed. The article is not yet over. I would like to discuss another angle and tell you as to how it is impacting us and what is it that we are talking about. There have been other things that have become conflicting or rather it has become a bone of contention, it has become a dispute, a kind of a contention between two authorities, between two people or between sets of people or let's say between government and a certain sect, a certain group of people. It has become a bone of contention. Citizenship Amendment Act was always in the news for certain conflicting reasons like this law was considered to be anti-secular. When I say the law was considered to be anti-secular, it included people only from six religions and it did not include people from other religions other than these six religions. Now, the purpose of providing citizenship to the people from these six religions are what? Are persecution in that country. So if people from the Hindu community, Jain, Buddh, Christian, if they are being uh, persecuted in let's say Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and because of that persecution, because of that exploitation, because of that um, um, lack of dignity of life in those countries, they have migrated to India and they have been living over here in oblivion, in, uh, without, in an in, in, uh, illegal uh, way, then they are to be granted citizenship. This is something which is supposed to be done. Now the point is that because there has been a clause or a criteria that they have been granted citizenship because they were persecuted in some other country. So the petitioners argue that persecuted com com uh, community is also Ahmadiyya community. This is also persecuted in Pakistan. 
Similarly, if we talk about Rohingyas, why aren't Rohingyas granted citizenship? They are all over the country and they are facing a threat of deportation now. So they are also persecuted in Myanmar and we haven't included Myanmar. A, a very valid argument I would say, I mean probably this is something which is questionable, but a very valid argument I would say is that we are granting citizenship to people from three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Where Pakistan and Bangladesh were historically a part of Indian territory, but Afghanistan was not. If Afghanistan was not a part of Indian territory, then how come you are granting citizenship to people from Afghanistan migrating from Afghanistan to India? In fact, instead of Afghanistan, you should have provided citizenship to people from Sri Lanka, the Lankans, especially the northern part, the Tamilians of Lanka. Lanka. They should be granted citizenship of India. Why aren't the Lankans being granted citizenship in India? This is a, the, these are the things which are being talked about. So CAA has multiple issues with respect to who is being granted citizenship, on what grounds, is it only on the basis of religion or there are criteria other than religion. If there are criteria other than religion, then persecution is also a criteria and followed by that, historically, if you say that you are granting citizenship to people from those places that were a part of undivided India, Afghanistan was never a part of India, instead Sri Lanka was a part of India. Have a look. Criticists uh, criticize the exclusion of refugees from Myanmar. We are talking about Rohingyas who are facing threats of dip, getting deported. Then inclusion of Afghanistan, this is something which is there. You have excluded Sri Lanka but you have included, included Afghanistan. This contradicts the rationale provided in the statement of object and reasons for the CAA. Petitioners argue that the selective inclusion of certain countries and exclusion of other undermines the stated purpose of the CAA that claims to provide succor to refugees fleeing persecution based on their religion. This is something that they have argued upon, as well as the Ahmadiyya community in Pakistan. So when we talk about these things, they actually are conflicting, but we also have to study that in context of the law which has been made by the government. So a very, very interesting take, and this is an absolutely different angle where we are not discussing about the CAA per se, that all of you know of, it has been overdone across multiple channels, across YouTube, across the years. So you don't have to, uh, I don't have to, fo I, d I didn't have to focus on that. I simply had to focus on the things which are other than that which are in news and which are actually contradictory. So you might get a question on dual citizenship in this year's prelims or mains, right? Now coming to another interesting article. This article is on GS3 environment. After many days we are doing an article on environment. Important for general studies paper number three, also important for prelims, right? So there's a concept which some of you might know of. It's by the name of carbon credits. This concept is extremely popular according to some global standards, uh, according to some global protocols, carbon credits came into existence. So basically carbon credits, what they mean is if you, if you stop or if you save, if you um, uh, hold yourself back in terms of emitting carbon dioxide or excessive carbon, carbon emissions from your industrial plants, from your manufacturing facilities, from your production units, then you earn carbon credits. When you earn carbon credits, then these carbon credits can be used to trade, which means you have earned something, now you can sell it to some other people. On the same mechanism, there have been different sort of credits that have been introduced and those credits are called the green credits. We call them the green credits. So what are these green credits and why are they important? Nowadays you would hear of multiple things which are green, green credits, green bonds, green GDP, green this, green that. What do we mean by green? What is so, what is the obsession with green? By the way, let me tell you, green is the color of envy, alright? So we are talking about the green credit program. This focuses on afforestation. This doesn't focus on afforestation outside my house. This doesn't focus on afforestation in Delhi, in Lutian's Delhi, or in Bombay, or Chennai, or Kochi, or Bangalore, or Hyderabad, or Calcutta, or Pune, or Bhuvaneshwar. It focuses on afforestation on the degraded land area. 
the degraded land area the land area that has been the facing degradation of quality the land area that has become barren because of its not much not of much use or because uh, it hadn't been inhabited for so long it was deserted long back and there has been no development on this land there have been no upliftment of this land which is why the people who are in this area are downtrodden and followed by that there are multiple land land areas where people don't live because there's nothing for that land to give this is the degraded land area these pockets have been identified by the government of india and these particular pockets have been earmarked under the green credit program of the government so looking at the degraded land area they have because they have become a part of the green credit program the degraded land area would be used or should be used by not by the government but by industries by producers by manufacturers for afforestation so if i am a manufacturer i go to a degraded land area i satisfy the criteria i take my permissions i prove that i am a genuine manufacturer and i grow i do afforestation in this land area i will be able to earn green credits i will be able to earn green credits then i can use those green credits for expanding my manufacturing base over here because for expanding it wherever my factory is i have to do what i have to do deforestation in order to cut trees in order to expand my factory area in order to expand my producing facility that deforestation is not allowed so what is the government of india doing it is compensating for the deforested area with afforestation and afforestation not anywhere you want afforestation only in the degraded land area so this solves two purposes the first purpose purpose is that your manufacturing your production will be sorted and that is something that is going to contribute towards the make in india campaign followed by that the second objective is government of india has uplifted this degraded land area with what with afforestation activities the program is called the green credit program let's have a look it's initiated by the environment ministry about afforestation projects on the degraded forest lands now when we talk about the degraded forest land look at this list greening the degraded lands this is the list which has been given by the environment ministry the chart shows the area and hectares of degraded forest land available for afforestation afforestation you have to grow trees you have to make forests over there where these many areas madhya pradesh 879 hectares chatisgarh assam telangana bihar rajasthan gujarat maharashtra odisha daman and dew so they are mostly spread they are spread out all across so if you are going to this particular area and you are doing afforestation you earn green credits so green credits registered and approved entities can finance afforestation projects in specific tracts of degraded forest and wetland so they are conducted by state forest departments they are conducted by them but they are initiated by the industry by the person who goes over there to aforest after 2 years of planting each tree planted in these projects could be worth one green credit one tree means one green credit the icfre is international council of forestry research and education evaluates the afforestation projects this will earn you the green credits now you might ask where to use these green credits utilization will be done in uh, green credits earned through afforestation projects can be used by the companies to fulfill their compensatory afforestation obligations they have the aforest afforestation obligations so they would be able to fulfill them because they have deforested at some place deforesting at one place means they have cut trees in order to make their factory in order to make the units so at the other place they have to aforest this is the place where they can a, a, a forest so it will do a compensation for that particular person and the companies that have diverted forest land for non forest purposes this is what has happened it would have resulted in deforestation clear trees can use credits to offset their obligations they can offset their obligations otherwise they would not get the permission from the environment ministry so i hope you are able to understand that the green credits is a scheme which is on a similar fashion like carbon credits but here afforestation and deforestation plus the degraded land area is being focused upon so green credit refers to incentives provided to individuals and entities engaged in environmentally positive activities
It is a voluntary government program aimed at incentivizing stakeholders for contributing to environmental preservation and sustainable practices. So lifestyle for environment encouraging voluntary environmentally positive actions are functioning over here and these are called as what? Green credits. So what all do you have to do? What all activities can you do in those degraded land areas? You can do tree plantation which is the most obvious thing. So when you plant trees, one tree would earn you one green credit. Water management, the water table management, ground level water management, making tanks, uh, making irrigation facilities. Sustainable agriculture, this is what you can develop. Sustainable agriculture, green agriculture, organic farming. Waste management, waste management can be done or whatever waste has been generated that can be managed. This is something which has to be done properly. In India, we don't have proper laws with respect to management of waste. So there are landfills. If you understand what landfills mean, landfills are that pieces of those pieces of land where the waste is dumped. If you come to Delhi, you go to the eastern uh, eastern Delhi area. There are hills of waste. Kure ka pahar, bade bade pahar hai. Kura, 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 kura. Waste, 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 waste. We don't have a proper system of waste management in India, and this is something that could create a huge problem because this is degrading our land, this is degrading, de degrading the underwater groundwater table and degrading the atmosphere. Everything is being degraded because of lack of management of waste. Air pollution reduction, mangrove conservation, anything, all of these are included as a part of the covered activities under the green credit program. Earning and calculation process. Participants need to register environmental activities through a dedicated website and undergo verification by a designated agency, whoever wants to participate. So in this particular case, who can participate or who can do this? Any person, an individual, a company. So all of these people can do or can participate, any group, any public and private company. So let's have a look. It allows individuals, groups, public and private sector units to earn and potentially trade green credits. They can trade, they can sell. So if someone else wants to deforest, I have green credits. I can sell it to that person. My green credits would be over and that person would be able to deforest. Identified parcels of degraded forest land totaling about 3853 hectares. So this has been distributed across 10 states, the names of which we had discussed uh, uh, earlier. Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, UP, etc. Uh, across 10 states, Chhattisgarh and MP contribute significantly accounting for up to 40% of the available forest land. So this has to be accounted for the available forest land. Green Credit Program, GCP, Green Credit Program. So a very, very nice article and an added thing that we have to also address are the concerns and challenges with the green credit program. So GCP has certain challenges. What are these challenges? Verification and validity complexity. Validation as in has it really contributed to afforestation? I mean it's pretty visible. If you say that this land is barren and today you can see 1000 trees, obviously afforestation has been done so verification is done. But other than that if you undertake other activities. Would that validation be done? Would that be necessary? Or how that validation would be done that whatever you are saying, you have actually done that. Highly important. Compatibility with carbon credits. Would they be compatible with carbon credits? Carbon credit is about greenhouse gas emissions. Are you able to control greenhouse gas emissions over here? So can you compare it with them or can you make it compatible with them uh, about the carbon credits? So because somehow if you are contributing towards green credits, in that particular case you have also stopped carbon emissions. So you should also be getting carbon credits, they have to be compatible, but there, there's no clarification on this. Accounting for regional differences, very very important. We have only added 10 states, what about the other states? Now I, this is not a very good argument, it, it's always that first you have to start, you must have seen that first start and then see the result and then you can expand prospectively. Nothing is done overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. So these are the concerns that are there. But the concerns can be over, we can overcome the concerns looking at, uh, looking at how the system pans out with respect to this. So a very nice article, a very interesting article. As I said, interest is something that should be there and that all of you should be absolutely aware of. If you find it interesting, I'm pretty sure you would be able to have a long focus on the topics that we are studying and you would be able to retain it for a long time. 
right now talking about the third article the third article is on health what is it that we are talking about health so the viruses don't seem to end does that mean that we are living in a world of viruses yes does that mean we are living in a world where viruses are rampant it's there who could stop covid who could stop the h1n1 virus nipah virus ebola virus and a plethora of other viruses which are there in the country which are there in the world and there are so many agencies so many people who are actually working on eliminating these viruses or at least if not elimination but to, but uh, but they are trying to re reduce the contagiousness of these virus or figuring out the ways to protect yourself from these viruses so these are the things that many agencies and people and companies are working on so here we are talking about another virus which is kind of a zoonotic virus zoonotic like covid was zoonotic any virus that infests animals and through animals it can enter humans are called as zoonotic viruses so anything like swine flu swine flu if you eat swine you would get that flu bird flu if you eat a bird if you eat chicken you will get that flu so just like bird flu swine flu we have another flu and what is that that is called as h5n1 flu h5n1 flu is a family of those viruses where it contributes towards avian influenza also known as bird flu is highly contagious viral infection primarily affecting birds which all of us know avian influenza bird flu it primarily uh, affects birds now the problem is not this we are so this is basically on the basis of the past experience as to which bird or which breed or which animal has been infected because of uh, because of the avian influenza or h5n1 virus but this time the virus has not been not not been seen in birds this time it's not in birds this time it's in a different animal and that different animal are cattle buffaloes cows they have been infected with this virus this was observed in the us so obviously it has affected the entire cattle industry along with cattle industry the meat industry has also been broadly hugely impacted have a look in late march 2024 a multi state outbreak of h5n1 in dairy cows was detected in the us marking the first time in this highly pathogenic strain of avian influenza pathogenic strain was found in cattle first time before this it was in birds the outbreak raised concerns about transmission routes highly important concerns about transmission routes how can this be transmitted it's pretty obvious it's a zoonotic virus if you eat the meat if you eat beef if you eat veal automatically it would infect you because if the cattle is infected and if we consume cattle if we will be infected plus if you i mean no, not many people rear cattle in the us but still whoever do can catch that virus from the animals and potential impacts on the dairy and meat industry yes this is the huge impact and plus we all of us consume dairy items milk so this is something which has become a huge cause of concern this has caused spillover events and this is something that we have to be careful about as to how it will impact the people in future so first let me explain to you about this highly pathogenic virus which is called the h5n1 virus so the transmission to humans is zoonotic it is by consumption of the produce which happens through or via cattle along with that it is something which has been seen as severity in humans it is severe in humans it is not so normally when there is flu if you catch a flu if i catch a flu no, the symptoms are the same you get a running nose you get cough you get fever you get pain in joints right so these things are very generic the, these are with respect to any normal virus any big virus these symptoms are common so this is what we get to know but the severity of this virus in humans is that you get a severe pneumonia and that can even lead to death it can lead to a multi organ failure it's a serious concern so which is why the severity of this virus is the normal generic symptoms along with those generic symptoms you also have severe symptoms and that is something which is contributing to this and this is something which is spilling over from animals to different breeds of animals to humans so let's have a look about this particular virus and its characteristics 
It's a subtype of avian influenza. The name is H5N1. It's a highly pathogenic in birds. And, today, and this year, recently it has been seen in cattle, sporadically infected humans. It results in severe illness and fatalities. It's high pathogenicity. It's known for its high pathogenicity in birds, often leading to severe illness and high mortality rates in infected poultry populations. Transmission to humans is rampant. The disease of birds can infect humans through direct contact with infected birds or their droppings. So their droppings also impact you. Human to human transmission is rare but can occur in close contact situations. It is contagious. I mean, all, normally all viruses are, not all, but most of the viruses are contagious. Normal, normal viral infection. If you, if you go to a school, if you go to a crowded place, you can catch that virus. Simple. Just like that. This virus is also like that. So it can lead to severe respiratory illness, breathing problems, severe pneumonia and organ failure. And organ failure. So the case fatality ratio for this virus is high, estimated at around 60%. Imagine, out of 100 people who have contracted the virus, 60% people, it can be fatal for 60% people. That's a very big percentage, very, very big percentage. This percentage wasn't even there with COVID. Spillover effects have been associated with spillover effects from birds to mammals. Spillover is that who else catches it? Different breed, different animals, humans, including humans. They can raise concerns about potential for pandemic if the virus were to acquire the ability for efficient H2H, human to human transmissions. So H5N1 outbreaks in poultry have occurred in numerous countries across Asia, Africa, Europe and the Middle East. Virus's potential to cause severe disease in humans and its ability to spread rapidly among bird populations make it a significant global health concern. So it's a global concern. The name of the virus is H5N1 virus. So you feel all kind of symptoms from mild to severe illness, pneumonia, death. Since 2003, this is an old virus, not a new mutation, not a new strain. Over 800 sporadic human cases have been reported with a high case fatality ratio. Spillover events have been seen and the disease surveillance and genomic surveillance are crucial for managing the outbreak and monitoring the virus's genetic makeup for potential changes. So this is about the new virus, H5N1 virus. This question can be asked in prelims. It can come in prelims, the, uh, the characteristics of this virus, where did it spread and what does it lead to? How does it happen? Is it zoonotic? Is it contagious? It is human to human? This kind of a question can be asked. Along with that, you can also be asked a question for mains GS paper number 3, as we have discussed. Now, coming to international relations, my favorite portion, an interesting portion. How can we miss international relations? So, there, were, there was an article. The article is about Kachatibu Islands, which actually, they, they better India-Sri Lanka relations. They have bettered India-Lanka relations. But they have marred this, uh, uh, the, the, the image of the Congress party. And since then, it has been in the news and, and always it keeps coming up and it keeps haunting the Congress party with respect to what they did five decades back. You know, just like emergency is something that haunts the Congress party that you declared an emergency, you declared an emergency to do. So you basically finished off the entire thing. You are talking about this regime being, being a dictator. What were you back then? So all of these things are characteristics of dictatorship but these these things haunt them here we are talking about a specific specific patch of islands which were called as kachatibu islands now these kachatibu islands are extremely popular amidst christians from tamil nadu as well as sri lanka let me first show you exactly where does it fall where exactly is this particular island now, this is Tamil Nadu, right, India, southeast, and this is Sri Lanka. Both the countries are separated by Ram Setu or Pamban Bridge. Obviously, you have read the Ramayana, you would have heard it, you would have watched it, right? So, this, is, this point is Rameshwaram, then you have the Pamban Bridge or the Ram Setu, and this is a pure, a very iconic train ride, which happens from here to Rameshwaram, not obviously to Sri Lanka. So here you have to cross via, uh, via boat or via uh, a ferry or whatever. That is the mode of transportation you take. This region is the Park Bay or the Park Street region. This is Bay of Bengal. 
and here is Arabian Sea. All right. In between these two countries and between the Park Strait and the Arabian Sea, the Park Strait or the Park Bay area has a certain has this point. This point is basically an island by the name of Kacha Thivu Island. Kacha Thivu Island used to come under India Indian jurisdiction post India's independence. It was under Indian jurisdiction. India used to administer this particular part of island. And India gave complete freedom because this island's importance was that it was used by people from a certain sect, a certain religion for, for their uh, purpose of worship because they used to consider it as a holy site for them. So a very popular day by the name of St. Anthony's festival permitted under, so this is uh, on this particular day, Indian fishermen visit Kacha Thivu annually and even Sri Lankan fishermen used to visit Kacha Thivu annually for this particular festival. Now what happened was way back in 1974, in order to have a diplomatic win, Srimati Indira Gandhi wanted Sri Lanka on her side, Sri Lankan support. Now to ask for Sri Lankan support was a bit difficult. So to what she thought can be done for Sri Lanka, if you give Sri Lanka what they want, then they would definitely be supporting you. So what they did was they ceded this island, the Kacha Thibu Islands to Sri Lanka. Matlab, it was given to you them that take this region. Aisa ho sakta hai? Can this happen? Is that your property? Can you just grant it away to someone? Obviously, you will get support from Sri Lanka. So, just like that, without having to fight for a particular area, we are, our, our people, our soldiers, our Jawans are fighting on the border to protect POK, to protect Aksai Chen, to protect Arunachal Pradesh region. And here you are giving away a region. What example does it set? So, permitted under the 1974 agreement, which allows them access for rest and drying of nets, but prohibits fishing. You are not allowed to fish. So you go over there because it has, uh, uh, it has a cultural and a historic religious value attached to it. The dispute over Kacha Thibu's ownership was settled through bilateral agreements between India and Sri Lanka in 1974 and 76 with both countries agreeing that the island belongs to Sri Lanka. India gained diplomatic benefits from the agreement. The agreement was that we are giving this island to you provided you support us with Sri Lanka including sovereign rights over wage banks marine resources near Kanyakumari. Fishermen arrested by Sri Lankan Navy are not related to Kacha Thibu but occur due to illegal fishing activities in Sri Lankan's waters, mainly using bottom trawlers which are banned in Sri Lanka. So there are, there are huge causes of concern. Uh, the fishermen's conflict is between Tamil-speaking fishermen from India and Sri Lanka. So basically Sri Lankan northern part, this Jaffna region, there are Tamilians inhabiting this region. So these people are also fishermen and obviously Tamil Nadu people, they speak Tamilian and they are also fishermen. They fish, they are constantly in tiff. So Indian fishermen, they end up getting arrested by the Sri Lankan Navy. This is a very common problem. Now the common problem, we cannot get, we cannot just ignore it. This is not an excuse that it's a common problem. But we have to make sure that they, they are released by the Sri Lankan Navy. In first place, they should not be arrested. And if they are arrested, they should be released. So India, Sri Lanka uh, 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 leaders, the external affairs leaders, what they did was they created a hotline. Number of people you have arrested, we should know by evening how many people you have arrested and then those people have to be sent back to India. And so primarily over bottom trawling which depletes marine resources and impacts the marine ecosystem. So trawling is banned in Sri Lanka. Opposition parties have criticized Modi's remarks because this time the Prime Minister himself has criticized the Congress party of giving away the Kacha Thibu Islands. And Sri Lanka's foreign minister stated there is no need to resume talks on the matter, which was resolved 50 years ago. So the talks, are, the, the point is that something that happened in 1974, what is the purpose of bringing it up right now? Fishermen from both countries have expressed concern, <laughs> emphasizing the need to address the actual fisheries conflict threatening marine ecosystems and livelihoods. So marine ecosystem being affected. Secondly, if you are not able to fish, then fishermen's livelihood and his family would be impacted. What is more important has to be seen, it has to be proved. So why are Kacha Thibu Pacts being questioned? It's purely political, not relevant for the examination. But what is relevant for the examination is the issue of fishermen who get arrested. They are not allowed to fish around the Kacha Thibu region. They are not allowed to fish around this region. But fishermen both from Sri Lanka and India, they somehow they end up fishing in that region because it is a rich fishing island. It's a rich fishing ground. 
when you start fishing in that region and you use the technology of trolling to have a greater catch, to have a better catch, then you end up getting arrested, which is a problem. It is a diplomatic issue, it is a diplomatic problem. So external affairs minister Jay Shankar supported the allegations on Sri Lanka, stating that bilateral agreements signed in 1974 and 76 by the Congress and DMK compromised Indian fishermen's rights in the Park Strait. So this is something that is being questioned and this is something why this issue is being brought up now. But again, I don't see any reason for bringing it up right now. It, have, it could have been done one year back. It could have been done one year later. But the timing, the timing is the entire thing. It's all about timing and politics and even in life. The next article is on energy. The focus these days is on renewable energy, which you might have seen, you might have observed. Renewable energy, renewable, renewable. So what is it that is so important about renewable energy? Now, since India is a tropical country, the focus is on solar energy. Plus India has a huge coastline, so the focus is on wind energy, tidal energy, hydel energy because of inland waterways. So India has potential for all forms of renewable energy, which is why we have created a new ministry, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. They implemented an executive order aiming to boost India's solar module manufacturing industry. Highly important. For the first time when this was enacted, it was via a scheme that was enacted in 2008. The name of the scheme was National Action Plan for Climate Change. According to this particular scheme, there, there were eight sub-schemes. There were eight sub-schemes. Amidst them, one scheme was National Solar Mission, Solar or Solar, National Solar Mission to use India's huge solar capacity and you can say to use India's huge um, potential for solar energy. Being a tropical country, we have access to sunlight for most of the day, for four to five hours every single day for most part of the year, 10, 11 months. Certain days we don't have access to sun because of clouds, because of fog, because of whatever. But other than that, we have access to solar energy. So why don't we use that energy to capture in solar modules and to capture in batteries? And then instead of manufacturing thermal energy, we can depend on solar energy. The problem with solar energy is that it's the modules, the panels, you might have seen solar panels above buildings, on, on parking spaces, on areas, even the cart sellers, the ready walas, they have solar panels on their small cart in order to generate electricity, which is the truth. So this is something which has been done. This is something which is important. But the point is it's very, very expensive. It's not a cheap technology. So if you manufacture at a, on a large scale, India's solar module manufacturing industry can result into this kind of an objective where we can use, it can be adopted by the masses and solar energy can be used. So the order requires solar module makers to undergo inspections of their manufacturing facilities by National Institute of Solar Energy to be certified as legitimate manufacturers. India heavily relies on imports of solar modules. We import solar modules obviously uh, from China, primarily from China despite being among the top manufacturers. Executive order aims to restrict imports, especially from China, which controls a significant portion of the global supply. And we need to source a substantial portion of electricity from non-fossil fuel by 2030. Obviously, the planning has to, has to start from now. So this is why Government of India brought a new scheme by the name of PM Kusum, Kusum scheme. The full form of Kusum is Kisan Urja Suraksha Evam Uthan Mahabhyan. It is aimed to ensure energy security for farmers, energy security in terms of proper access to electricity for farmers, along with honoring India's commitment to increase the share of installed capacity of electric power from non-fossil fuel forces, forces, sources to 40% by 2030. This is the entire target, to up to 40%. Out of the total consumption, 40% should come from non-fossil fuel sources. So PM Kusum is contributing towards energy efficiency. In order to make this scheme successful and in order to make the solar energy scheme successful, we have what? A production linked incentive scheme, a PLI scheme for national program on high energy or high efficiency solar PV modules. 
for achieving manufacturing capacity of gigawatt scale in high efficiency solar PV modules with outlay of 24,000 crores. Solar PV manufacturers are selected through transparent selection process and accordingly they contribute to, to, towards this. The point is that these schemes basically they encourage you in order to get access to what? The production linked incentive scheme and to make sure whatever you are being given you get a benefit out of it. So production linkedness, if you produce this much number, you will be given an incentive by the government. Incentive is in any form. Incentive is in forms of that you are given some taxation refund or any kind of incentive has been granted on this particular basis, the PLI scheme. So automatically the objective is to build, is to promote two, three things. The first objective is that you have to depend on non-fossil fuel sources. Second, those sources, they don't they protect the environment so environmental protection is mandatory third you are wanting to do it in india which is why make in india would be successful out of this so all of these things together they would contribute towards the success of this particular scheme the name is pm kusum scheme the pli scheme these schemes have been implemented so again an important article from environmental point of view as well as from the governance point of view it's also important from governance point of view Then comes an article on GS3 economics. <clears throat> Women's employment. This topic is also important for social issues. Social issues, which is a part of GS1. And the schemes are, are a part of, I mean, every paper. They can be used in GS2, GS3. They can be used for prelims. So what are we talking about in this particular case? We are talking about the labor force participation labor force participation rate lfpr a very popular term in the newspapers and if you have studied economics here we are talking about the female lfpr how so within the labor force what is the participation of females so female lfpr female lfpr has mostly occurred in rural areas and self employment often representing the unpaid work we are talking about the unpaid work the work which is not paid Reasons for low women's participation in the labor force include societal norms limited to job opportunities, caregiving responsibilities, safety concerns and transportation constraints. So, I mean, what is it? So basically, what is it that is stopping the females from participating in labor force? The patriarchal mindset, uh, the traditional mindset that women don't work, transportation, how do women reach the workplace? This is a very big a constraint, transportation constraint, safety concerns, yes, what kind of a job would you do, is it safe, is it safe for your health, right, uh, caregiving responsibilities at workplaces, so this is something that we are talking about as a part of women's employment. Female LFPR significantly is lower compared to males, with women facing barriers such as limited job opportunities, caregiving responsibilities, low wages, safety concerns, so these are things which are stopping or which are actually uh, not allowing the females to contribute much, which is why these reasons have to resolve. So in order to resolve these reasons, there have been certain schemes by the government of India. We'll study those schemes. So LFPR and workforce participation rate have improved. The unemployment rates showed deterioration between these 19 years before recovery. So how do we look at it? See, <coughs> the important schemes are Beti Bachao Beti Padhao scheme 2015. This is a women empowerment scheme to prevent gender biased sex selective elimination. So you save the girl child by educating the girl child, survival and protection of the girl child, followed by that one stop center scheme 2015 to provide support and assistance to women affected by violence both in private and public spaces to facilitate in filling FIR, NCR, first information report NCR if there is any kind of if there is any person who wants to complain uh, and provide physio-social support to counselling to women and girls. Women helpline scheme, very very important, 24-7 helpline that should be provided, available anytime, plus the help should be available. Ujwala scheme to protect women's health, women and children for commercial sexual exploitation, women working hostel, the, a very old scheme has been implemented since then, Swadhar Grah to cater to the primary need for shelter, food, clothing, medical treatment, care of women in distress support to training and employment program for women to provide skills that give employability to women. 
So all these schemes have been done and these schemes have been heavily useful in making sure that we are empowering women in a specific fashion. But again we come to the point that female labor force participation is less. That should increase. So what are we doing in order for that to increase is something that we need to understand, something that we need to apply. So a very, very good article, important for GS1, GS2, governance also it would be important and obviously GS3 because we are talking about the labor force participation rate. Just to give you a tip, when you are studying economics, do study the formulas to calculate unemployment rate, WPR, LFPR, what is labor force and what is the proportion employed and the proportion unemployed. These are the things that you have to understand and cover. All right. Let's quickly have a look at the uh, main questions. So the significance of robust health infrastructure in a nation's development and the challenges faced in ensuring equitable access to healthcare services. Challenges faced to uh, ensure equitable access to healthcare services. You have to write this in 150 words. Discuss. Discuss the significance of robust health infrastructure in a nation's development. What is the contribution of health infrastructure in a nation's development? Has to be discussed. Question number two, critically evaluate the effectiveness of PLI scheme in promoting domestic manufacturing and innovation in the solar energy sector in India. Very, very important. So this is something that can be asked. So this is a very specific question with respect to the PLI scheme only. If a question had been generic, that what is the government of India doing in order to promote the solar system in India? So you can write about PM Kusum, you can write about PLI scheme, you can write about uh, uh, multiple things with respect to the initiatives which are taken by the government with what aim, what is the aim of providing these kind of services, right? Then we come to the prelims bites. The green credit refers to a unit of incentive provided to individuals and entities engaged in activities that deliver a positive impact on the environment. This is the green credit that we have understood. Carbon credit are tradable permits or certificates representing right to emit one ton of carbon dioxide, carbon emissions or its equivalent greenhouse gas. So carbon credits are a different concept. It is a global concept. Green credit is something that we are planning to implement in India. We are trying to implement that in India. These are the snippets or bites that you have to remember. Please remember these bites. So that is all about today's newspaper. So how was it? Did you enjoy today's newspaper guys? I hope you've enjoyed it. That will be all. We'll be coming up with more exciting videos soon. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Take care and all the best.